Welcome back. Happy to have you here. We are moving ahead, backwards in history, ahead. We're moving backwards in history uh, to, as promised, uh, start playing some of that World War I game hall, which if you have not seen that video, I will provide a link um, for you here on screen so you can check that out. But this is going to be the first of a couple of World War I games that I'm going to explore. And if you're looking at this and saying, well, wait a second, and that looks awfully similar to 1914 Serbian Mustyrbian, I would say you have a keen eye, you are correct, and that is because uh, this is the Battle for Galicia 1914 from designer Michael Resch, who was also the designer of 1914 Serbian Mustyrbian, uh, as well as 1914 Offensive à Outrance, Twilight in the East, um, and uh, he is well known for his World War I um, games. And this is an Eastern Front uh, divisional scale game that, from what I understand, came out uh, quite a long time ago originally. It came out in 2006. Um, so I think one of his earlier designs, um, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and it was recently republished in 2018 in Paper Wars magazine from Compass Games um, with sort of an updated, uh, some, some updates to it. I'm not sure exactly specifically. I'm not sure if the map uh, or is sort of the same or it's been redone a little bit, but uh, certainly it has Michael Resch's art style um, or at least aesthetic uh, preferences uh, to it. Kind of it's got a very similar color palette to uh, Offensiva Outrance. And the counters as well, very sort of his style, very utilitarian, um, but very clear informationally. And uh, it's interesting to me that he uh, chose to use the same color palette as Serbian Mustyrbian for the counters. Um, typically, uh, you see, well, obviously the Austro-Hungarians are in his that signature sort of uh, blue-gray. Uh, but these are the Russians, and uh, they are sort of this brown color. I'm trying to think of the uh, other games that have Russians in brown. And the first one that comes to mind is OSG's Napoleonic series, where the Russians are sort of a dark brown color. Um, but pretty interesting that uh, they went with this color palette rather than like a green or even a white. Um, so uh, this game is uh, pretty, it's, it's using, let's see, how do, how do I describe this? It certainly has a lot of Mike Resch's design um, touches to it. So it's using a very similar combat system to things like Twilight in the East, Offensiva Outrance, and especially closer to the second edition of Offensiva Outrance and Serbian Mysturbian than the sort of revised third edition rules. So uh, it's got a lot of very similar aspects to it. Uh, you've got, um, you know, a basically three, two or three roles in combat where you're looking at you know, um, you're, you're looking at uh, doing an attack, what size is the attack, the, the, the CRT, combat results table, gives you a, a, a die roll modifier rather than an actual effect on the unit, and then you roll on another chart with that die roll modifier to see whether or not your units take what are called combat effectiveness reduction. So all very familiar if you watch my Serbian Mysterbian video. Now where this game differs is that it's much simpler. The, I think it's like eight, nine pages of rules all told together, so we're not talking about a giant monster game with lots of chrome. I think this is going to be a pretty playable uh, World War One opening days of World War One Eastern Front game. Um, obviously, if you watch my 1914 When Eagles Fight video, you'll recognize this part of the world. We've got this uh, city here, this Austro-Hungarian city, which I am not going to try and pronounce again. Someone, uh, someone said it in the World War One Hall video, uh, and I still don't know that I have it. I should probably look online and listen to someone say it. Um, but you can see that the Russians are kind of coming in here. And by the way, uh, on the map, this way is north. So we've got Galicia here running kind of like this. Um, we've got the Russians coming down from the north. And uh, they are going to try and sweep in here and take some of these Austro-Hungarian towns. In this game, you get victory points for a couple of different things. And the player at the end of the game, whoever has the most victory points, is going to be the winner. Um, and uh, the game will last 12 turns. So basically three weeks from August 23rd to September 14th. Every turn is two days. You can see here on the turn track. And what's pretty interesting is that you actually score victory points uh, for the first half of the game by simply launching attack with your attacks with your infantry. So every time an infantry unit attacks... Uh, you get a VP. Um, and that's kind of cool because it's going to sort of uh, force and, and sort of uh, try and incite uh, conflict between the two sides. Both sides are going to want to get into contact with each other and launch attacks back and forth basically as many places as they can. So hopefully we'll um, sort of get some nice World War One flavor from that. Uh, and uh, and that's basically it. Um, I'll kind of, you know, if there's anything meaningful about the rules that I think you need to see, we'll, we'll, I'll show it to you as we play the game per usual. We've got two different types of units, infantry and cavalry. You can see the cavalry units have sort of the, that same style of half and half colors. 
uh, in this game. And um, what's interesting here is that cavalry and infantry cannot be part of the same attack together. So uh, that is also going to be a tactical consideration. Before I get into the strategy for both sides, which sounds like where the discussion is heading, I do want to uh, just bring up a couple of things. So like I said, this is a Paper Wars magazine game from spring, no, actually not 2018, excuse me, winter of 2020. It's Paper Wars issue 97. I uh, Please, I mistook myself. It is winter 2020. So last year, uh, uh, issue of Paper Wars, issue 97, came out recently, so it should be available if you like what you see here. Uh, the other weird thing, which I'm not quite sure, so uh, what's going on there? So I ordered this game from Compass's website. Um, I really like how big the counters and the hexes are, especially. Uh, these look like 9 16 inch counters, I would say, maybe. Uh, but the hexes are huge. I mean, here's my finger for scale, here's my hand for scale. Uh, really big hexes, love that. Um, really helps playability for sure. And uh, the counters are actually really nice and thick. They're they're a really thick brown core, um, if you can see that. So they're really nice. You probably won't need tweezers. You can use your hands for this one, great. Um, although the one thing that is weird that I was gonna say was that after I ordered the game, um, I got a follow-up package uh, from Compass Games like a week later with, with no notification that it had shipped and no indication of what was in it. Um, but it came with a bunch of new markers, new combat effect markers, so more of these. Um, that were, uh, I guess, like a whole nother set of these. It was a half counter sheet and uh, a set of low supply markers, which I guess were supposed to be included in the uh, game itself and were not. But what's interesting is that these are a different stock than the actual rest of the counters. Um, so that's a little weird. Uh, and they didn't give me a heads up. They were sending it to me and they sent it to me in two different packages. So not quite sure what was going on there, but I would assume that if you buy this game from Compass, you will get the replacement uh, or the additional counter sheet, I should say, uh, shortly afterwards. I'm not sure if that was a printing mistake or what was going on there. So anyways, uh, let's dive into what both sides are trying to accomplish and how they accomplish it and maybe some ways that they might go about doing that. And then we'll jump into gameplay. So, like I mentioned, uh, both sides going after victory points. A lot of victory points are going to be tied to geographic areas. You can see up here, Lublin, Chelm, uh, Krasnatov up there, Hrubishov, Shav, Hrubishov over here. Uh, anyways, the Austro-Hungarians are going to be wanting to drive on the western side of the map up and capture a bunch of these Russian-controlled cities. There's uh, When you capture a city, uh, you get victory points, so Lublin, for example, you get victory points for capturing it initially, in this case 10, so that's a major objective for the Austro-Hungarians, huge batch of points there. But every turn you re retain control of those cities, you get a number of additional points at the end of every turn. So Lublin is worth 10 on initial conquering, and then 2 for every turn that the Austro-Hungarians manage to hold it. Now, the bulk of the Austro-Hungarian force is down here in the west, as you can see, all along this sort of forest line, this forest area. And uh, they're going to want to try and drive north, punch a hole through these Russians, get to Lublin, and uh, hold it for as long as possible. They've got a ton of infantry strength over here which to do that. Uh, the Russians have a pretty stout uh, infantry line here as well, and they also have a bunch of cavalry in the area that they can use to kind of screen and disrupt those uh, plans. Um, supply in this game is pretty simple. It's mostly traced along rail lines or if you can trace back to a supply source directly, um, which are sort of on the, on the south end of the map down here that you're not seeing on the screen right now. Uh, and the Russians, it's the same. They're going to be able to trace back up to these uh, supply areas up here. The Russians, pretty good supply situation around Lublin, so the Austro-Hungarians will have their work cut out for them if they want to make progress. Coming over here to the eastern side of the map, let's see if I can get it in frame. Ooh. Uh, we've got obviously Lemberg here. This is going to be um, a major target for the Russians as they come down from the north in this direction. They obviously have a much larger volume of strength here along this uh, approach. Um, and as we zoom out a little bit, you can see that the Austro-Hungarians pretty thinly defended here. Um, and not only thinly defended, but a lot of it is cavalry, which is going to be significantly weaker than the infantry coming in although they will be able to retreat before combat uh, in reaction. If they so choose, they're probably going to have to do that. Uh, interestingly, at this scale, uh, Mike Resch has decided that forests don't have any effect on combat, so uh, all of these forest hexes, while they do cost more to move through, I believe, they do not uh, have any effect on fighting that happens in and around them. And the same is true of cities and towns. There's no real combat effect for those as well. So it's going to make defending Lemberg here in clear terrain uh, pretty tough for the Austro-Hungarians, and they're going to need to figure out a way to do that while making sure they keep their supply lines open. Uh, down here to the south. Now, these Austro-Hungarians here, uh, the ones turned sideways, it cannot actually move until turn two or three, as indicated on the counter, and they're not actually allowed to enter any of these border hexes here until turn five. 
So the Russians kind of have, um, they can, they have a pretty good lockdown coming down out of this direction, um, and they may able to be able to push the uh, Austro-Hungarians here to the west out of Lemberg towards the fortress down here. Now this fortress is extremely dangerous. You see that the, the fortress here has these hexes that are shaded around. Um, the Austro-Hungarians get a ton of benefit attacking out of this town into those hexes. So the Russians definitely do not want to be up close here uh, trying to like uh, surround it and cordon it off. Um, it's going to have to, if they do that, it's going to have to be sort of a wider cordon here. And that, I think, uh, represents sort of the, the desire to fight for the Austro-Hungarians. After, historically, I believe the Russians pushed past this, um, the Austro-Hungarians held out here and just kind of, um, you know, the Russians surrounded it and didn't really touch it and just kind of left it behind enemy lines until the Austro-Hungarians and Germans were able to counterattack. Um, but it does, it does appear that the Austro-Hungarians aren't going to be able to hold much of this. Um, you know, there's a river line down here that they may be able to form up uh, the Dniester uh, and form a defense here, but they do have to be careful because most of the victory point hexes that the Russians want, specifically Lemberg, uh, are here. So they're going to have to figure out how heavily they want to defend that or if they fall back and then maybe counterattack later. They could also peel forces off from this advance that they're going to be making, um, to potentially either, uh, you know, screen that route somewhere up here or peel off and counterattack that way. So the Russians have to be careful that they don't get too deep and then get pinched off and surrounded. And then for the Russian perspective, obviously, they're going to be a big steamroller um, and they want to get down here as quickly as possible. Uh, from this direction and defend in this direction. Although, you know, if some things go horribly wrong for one side or the other, it may open up some opportunities. I think in this game, I am considering, um, instead of sort of a broad front approach, which I typically do in games, and sometimes it doesn't work out well, I might see what it looks like to have one side do sort of a very focused tip of the spear, kind of single point um, uh, drive deep, um, and then see if I can sort of expand that out. Uh, but we'll see how it develops, because right now a lot of these units are not in contact with each other, and I think the way the game is going to start, we might see some cavalry skirmishes uh, to begin with, at the very least, up here and up here, uh, and that might define the lines of advance for both sides. So uh, that's kind of where we are. The most important things in this game are these ridge lines and river lines, and there aren't too many of them in most places. The Austro-Hungarians have a natural kind of defensive barrier uh, down along this area, but if, if they're pushed back that far, the Russians are doing quite good for themselves, so... Um, that's probably a losing proposition for them. But um, we'll see where we go. The first turn of the game skips the Russian movement step, which is, I guess it's assumed that they have moved into these positions on the, on the first turn of the game on August 23rd. And the Austro-Hungarians will be the ones that will take the first uh, movement and combat phase uh, to go with turn one. And that's going to mean that the Austro-Hungarians, depending on what they do, are going to jump out to an early victory point lead because, like I said, you're going to get a victory point for every unit that you attack with infantry um, every time, basically until turn eight. Excuse me, turn eight, not turn... Uh, Nope, yeah, turn nine, turn nine. It's, it's September 8th, but turn nine. Um, so yeah, so the Austro-Hungarians are going to enjoy a bit of an initial advantage, and then we'll see what the Russians can do in response. Um, this should be pretty fun. I like the look of this game so far. I like that the rules are pretty simple and playable. It's a nice change of pace from OCS, and of course, we're getting back into World War I, so I hope you stay with me um, as we uh, get into it. All right, here at the end of uh, turn one, which is a half a turn, really, the Austro-Hungarian uh, initial uh, attack, we'll say, um, and they had a very good turn over here in the west. Um, this, uh, the first core here absolutely just blew through a Russian brigade that was entirely eliminated from the combat. Um, and uh, this, the fifth corps here ended up doing severe losses to the um, 45th division here. Uh, they d reduced its combat strength four total times. So in this game, when you get combat effectiveness reductions, you start normal. The first combat effectiveness reduction would go here on top and that would do minus one to your combat factors. Then the second combat, uh, reduction, uh, combat effectiveness reduction, again, would re reduce it by two. For the third one, you actually then take a step loss um, and then they had one more that they had to suffer. So this this division is in just a horrible way right now. It got absolutely crushed. And part of that was because the um, Austro-Hungarian artillery here, especially in the Fifth Corps, was so powerful. It adds a crazy die roll modifier um, to the losses that you take. So uh, the things I am learning immediately uh, about this combat results table, let me show you that if I can get it into position. So the things I'm learning immediately about this combat result table is, um, first of all, you want to roll low, not high. That was confusing to me for a second. Um, but more than that, in a large magnitude combat, artillery, uh, so what you do is you get a value here. It's, a, it's some sort of DRM for the attacker and the defender. And then you use that DRM on to, based on how big the combat was to see um, how many uh, uh, combat effectiveness reductions you're taking 
um, based on what you roll. So for example, if I rolled a seven and we had a large combat, the, the unit involved would take two step reductions. Now here's where it comes in, here's where artillery comes into play. Based on the amount of artillery you're facing against, you can get some very high DRMs. Um, and in fact, the Russians rolled maximum on their DRM, uh, on the die roll twice with DRMs from Austro-Hungarian artillery. So that's why you see a division taking four step losses and a brigade who absolutely just got annihilated uh, in that first round of attack. So um, pretty deadly so far, I would say. Um, at least in terms of these attacks where the Austro-Hungarians have a lot of concentrated force along the line and they're in prime position now to try and make a breakthrough to Lublin. So uh, the Russians going to have to think about that on their first turn. However, it's um, the Russians are also going to have to think about uh, exactly what's going to happen over here because I have all these cubes lined up to remind me that a boatload of Russian troops are going to come in off this side of the map in this area. The Austro-Hungarians moved forward out of Lemberg to kind of set up zones of control and a bunch of these... Um, sort of rear areas behind this cavalry who's probably going to withdraw as soon as those Russians enter. Um, and in general, just kind of slow down the march. They don't want to sort of engage in a, in a full strength defense along here. There's really no defensible terrain and they're really spread out. So we're likely to see this shrink over the coming turns. And as I looked at the terrain, I see that the Russian advance, the speed of the Russian advance is going to be heavily dictated by these woods. So the Austro-Hungarian cavalry has moved up to sort of plug some of these holes, throw zones of control around these woods, force the Russians to have to spend movement points um, either to go around or to uh, shunt these cavalry out of the way. But that's obviously going to cost time, and the Austro-Hungarians are okay with that. There's also a small river here that this cavalry unit is holding a crossing. And if the Russians don't want to take that crossing, um, they've got to march a long way around either this way or this way um, to get through here. So it'll be interesting to see what they decide to do. Now this cavalry unit is pretty weak, but you are halved across a river like this. So, um, you know, the Russian 21st Corps may decide that it's worth it to try and force the issue, but we'll see coming up on the next turn. So uh, overall, this is where we stand coming into August 25th, and the Austro-Hungarians have sort of set the tone for what we're about to see. Here we are uh, right at the beginning of turn four. Um, so we've played a little bit into the game, about a week's worth of game time. Um, well, a little less than a week's worth of game time. And um, so it's a really interesting dynamic here that I'll talk about sort of more broadly in a second. But here on the, the western, um, northwestern side of the map where the Austro-Hungarians are on sort of the attack heading towards Lemberg here, they have managed to push the Russians uh, back quite a bit across this open terrain. Uh, they have been getting great roles um, on their combat results uh, table uh, in hitting retreats. Um, and the Russians have been sort of giving ground on their turn, pulling back. They just don't have the forces to really contest uh, all of these units that the Austro-Hungarians have. And, and the one thing they're worried about is, you know, if they were to put up a, a tighter defense, a, a more engaged defense, that it would wear their units out. I mean, you can see here's the, the Guard Reserve Corps. Um, they've got a minus one combat effectiveness, but this goes really quickly. I mean, in, in a single battle, depending on how big your stack is, you can acquire two or three of those usually, and three is enough to flip you over. And uh, it's really hard to recover steps in this game because you need to uh, come off the line. So the Russians have been trying to give ground and recover their, their losses. The general strategic theory here for the Russians being, we're going to let the Austro-Hungarians wear themselves out. We're going to let them use up all of their unit quality and combat effectiveness driving towards Lemberg. And then when they get close to the city, um, that's when we'll counter the Russians will counterattack and uh, take advantage of the fact that a bunch of the Austro-Hungarian stacks have been spent, essentially. And you can see that here with the Austro-Hungarian 10th Corps. They've got a combat effectiveness uh, hit there and a hit there. And that adds up really quickly, actually. Um, it, so this stack normally would be a 13 uh, attack strength. Now it's only 12, or sorry, 11. And uh, that's usually not good enough for a solid attack on the uh, on the, the way the CRT is structured. And obviously, if you make bad attacks in this game, it compounds the fact that you're already combat ineffective because it adds more to your combat ineffectiveness. So you really have to pick your fights where you think you can win and uh, give better than you get as the attacker. Um, and uh, the Russians, you know, a little concerned about uh, Lublin up here. They've had the uh, 14th Corps um, where one unit's already been absolutely destroyed. Uh, this, this one here, we've got two reduced strength units who just took more combat ineffectiveness hit, or combat effectiveness hits, and they've retreated to the city. Um, so they're in kind of a bad way. The 6th, 16th Corps, yeah, 16th Corps there is gearing up potentially for a counterattack. Most of the damage from the Austro-Hungarians has been coming from the 1st Corps here. They've been on a, on a tear through this western part of the map. Um, and this terrain here, but, uh, you know, on 
because of that, they're also, there's a minus two combat effectiveness under there. There's a minus two combat effectiveness under there. They are um, hurting pretty badly. So they're ripe for a counterattack. If the Russians can find some some strength to bring in here, it might be time for the, the guard reserve here to come come down and, you know, the 16th quarter to counterattack. So I think the Russians, it's all going according to plan for the Russians here. They're trying to let the Austro-Hungarians use their strength up in the rush to Lublin and then hit them hard on the way back um, and hopefully push them back south. Now, the Austro-Hungarians did get some nice reinforcements um, on the last turn. Just off screen here, you've got this 17th Corps, who's a, a pretty sizable uh, um, Corps uh, with, with divisional units coming up here. You've got the 5th Corps here. They took a turn to recover, so they're going to be fresh um, to get into the fight. So uh, we're, we're looking at a pretty interesting situation um, coming up. And then obviously the cavalry screen here is going to keep the Russians from making too much of a counterpunch going. Um, it will slow them down a little bit. Um, here in the middle uh, of the map, uh, there's a bit of a soft spot developing for the Austro-Hungarians here. They've just basically got this cavalry division here at uh, Rava Ruska, Rava Ruska, probably Rava Ruska. Uh, here at sort of the confluence of a bunch of these rail lines, the Austro-Hungarians definitely want to hold that to make sure that they can uh, keep their supply network as, as wide as possible. You've had some uh, brigades, a brigade here providing cover for this division who took some hits last turn and had to pull, pull back off the line. And the 6th Corps here just really making sure the Russians don't get creative and try anything silly um, here along the border. But if the Russians can figure out a way to exploit this hole, uh, there is nothing really between them and uh, Lemberg all the way down here. And then obviously over on the right, it's a, it's basically the opposite story over here. We've got uh, just uh, those, all those Russians I told you about that came on the board here in the east, um, they have done a number on a bunch of these Austro-Hungarian cores. There's a minus two combat effectiveness, minus one there. We've got uh, we've got a fresh core here that's going to try and um, hold. Uh, and then the, the Russian 10th Corps has taken some hits, but they've got more units backing them up ready to go. And, um, you know, the Russians are a lot... It's kind of a race at this point, really. Here, I'll zoom out and show you. Um, really interesting dynamic. You've got here's the whole here's the whole front through Galicia. You've got the Russians with with the head of the snake down here and the tail of their own snake over here, and the Austro-Hungarians with essentially the reverse. Um, and it's basically who can get to their victory uh, conditions uh, and hold them better than the other player. Um, now, the one thing working against the Austro-Hungarians right now is that their biggest reinforcement was turn two, and it only gets worse through the rest of the game. They've got a, another sizable, or they did get another sizable one on turn three, which um, maybe I actually forgot to place. Uh, I got to fix that. Um, and then, you know, it kind of trails off here towards the end. So uh, really interesting situation uh, developing here. Um, and a kind of a cool dynamic, especially if you're playing head to head. I think this would be a really fun sort of uh, punch counter punch game because both sides have to play offense and defense against each other, which makes for a really cool uh, situation um, to be playing. So uh, that's where we are at the end of turn three. And uh, we're going to do several more. And uh, if something important happens, uh, you will not miss it. Okay, fix the reinforcement situation for the Austro-Hungarians. Can't believe I forgot that. It didn't really have an effect on the turn. You can see some uh, new units filtered in up here towards Lemberg. There's a there's a brigade now uh, helping defend the city. Uh, and then over here, we had some Austro-Hungarians come in here at Stanislaw, and they decided that they were going to cross this river into the rear of the Russian 8th Corps. And uh, they made an attack on this unit here, managed to push him off. He didn't suffer any effective, uh, effectiveness losses. It was a small combat, but they ended up taking two. So... Maybe not the best use of those forces, but they did manage to secure the the, the river, the bridge here, um, which means that the Russians aren't going to be able to come down south even if, if they want to, at least right now. It also means that this particular division is um, is surrounded, and that's a two-column shift uh, in the next attack by the Austro-Hungarians if he does not uh, get out of there. So um, interesting kind of thing here. The Russians trying to protect their supply lines uh, basically back to here um, where they need to get supply from. Uh, and so far, so good. What's interesting about this game is that you can actually draw a supply line through a single zone of control on your way back to tracing, um, which is interesting. I've never seen another game that allows that but if you have to trace your supply line through two zones of two different zones of control um, then you're out of, out of supply so uh, that's where we are at the end of turn three beginning turn four it's going to be the russians that are up they are going to get a nice batch of reinforcements and uh yeah situation after turn six we're about to start the september 4th turn which is turn seven so we're exactly halfway through the game and uh, the state of things is uh, very World War I. Uh, the Austro-Hungarians have been unable to make any progress towards Lublin. Uh, they've just run into a brick wall against the Russians up here uh, in the northwest. 
Part of the army, uh, the 10th Corps and the 2nd Corps, um, and to a lesser extent the 6th Corps, has decided to split off and make a lunge toward Rubisov, which is worth 3 points and 1 point a turn, defended only by the Russian 19th Corps, which had to fall back after they uh, tried to make an attack and, and split the Austro-Hungarian army kind of along this axis and kind of isolate the pocket heading for Lublin. That didn't work out too well. So uh, the Austro-Hungarians decided we're going to try and exploit that. The Russians have a lot of worn out stacks of units up here. Um, and so they decided to fall back to protect um, Kras, uh, Krasnostov and prevent the approach to Chelm <clears throat> from being um, wide open. So uh, that's kind of uh, where we stand in the Northwest. What's interesting about this game, um, and I'm having a really great time with it so far, but uh, what's really interesting is that obviously World War One it, it, it uh, has that sort of grinding, plotting style uh, that you would expect and, and feels very similar to, you know, 1914 Serbian Misturbian and his other designs, and that makes sense because it's using the same sort of basic combat system here. But um, this game, for some reason, and, and I have some thoughts that I'll give at the end, um, but feels a lot better and a lot more... Um, satisfying, I guess, is the word I'm looking for uh, in terms of playing it. Um, and I, it's really interesting because, it, you know, not too much is different here from Serbian Misturbian, but um, enough is that it actually, I think, makes for a better game. Uh, but you can see that, like, uh, you know, you, you have these situations where, you know, you make an attack and you wear out all your guys, um, and then the opponent counterattacks and they wear out all their guys because defense is just objectively better in this game. And so then you start to get into this real, like, uh, interesting decision space where it's like, okay, how far can I push one of these cores? Can I get one more attack in? Can I find that breakthrough that I need? Um, and oftentimes the answer is no, which uh, also feels very World War One, and you end up just kind of um, depleting your, your attack ability, your attack strength. Uh, and leaving the door open for the enemy to hit you back and back and forth you go, you know, each side trying to find that that foothold that will allow them to push back a little bit. I think the Russians have gotten the better of the Austro-Hungarians up here uh, in the defense of Lublin. They've been able to a couple turns in a row start reorganizing these units here and they're going to be in a really good spot to take on some of these uh, Austro-Hungarian stacks who also had to sort of abort the attack and start to reorganize otherwise they were going to be very fragile. Um, and so it's just a really, it, it's very evocative of World War One, where, you know, you're throwing bodies at the problem, throwing bodies at the problem, nothing seems to be working, and suddenly you realize, oh God, I don't have any more bodies to throw at the problem. I've got holes in my line. Where can I find forces to just plug the hole, you know, for just a little bit so that I can get some units back and and uh, back up to full fighting strength and make another try and make another try. And you go through that cycle kind of pretty uh, frequently over, you know, two or three turns. And uh, it starts to really feel like a grind. You're grinding against the opponent. The opponent's grinding against you. And you're trying to make sure that you're out grinding them. Uh, so it, it's very cool. Uh, it's very cool. And it's, you know, something that you wouldn't necessarily uh, understand about the game until you started playing it. So I really like that aspect of it. Um, you know, this is not World War II. Coming from... Um, Coming from OCS, this is a much different uh, feel, and, and it should be a different feel. <clears throat> so here we are down here by down here near Lemberg. The Russians had gotten into the neighborhood. They were here, um, and they had just about were about to make an attack on some of these weaker Austro-Hungarian stacks here. The, these kind of guys are in sort of to their limit at this point. Nothing really defending down here for the most part. These Russian corps are pretty fresh, so this next Russian turn is going to be pretty interesting to see what happens. These cavalry are probably going to fall back. Um, but, you know, the first sort of thrust towards Lemberg, the Austro-Hungarians managed to turn back. These these Russian units were knocking on the door. Um, the 14th Corps for the Austro-Hungarians just finished reforming, so they're going to be able to hop in here uh, to protect the city. Um, but uh, so the Russians are going to have to hurry and they're probably this turn going to make a really strong push up this direction to see if they can at least put some pressure uh, into the sort of outlying uh, territories and areas. The Austro-Hungarians got one reinforcement last turn that they optionally could have deferred to this turn, which they chose to do because of its entry position. Um, but the good news for the Austro-Hungarians is that they've got a couple German divisions um, coming next, uh, coming this turn, um, in the second half of the turn. So, uh, that will significantly bolster their, uh, their forces. Those German divisions come on, um, but they actually interestingly come on up, up this direction towards, uh, towards Lublin. So, uh, the defense of Lemberg then is going to rest on the, uh, what they've got here, uh, essentially. And the, the Russians, you know, uh, they made a really strong attack. They pushed a lot of these div divisions back. 
But the Russians themselves, like I said, really hurting now, um, especially here, there was a retreat. This stack here has been trying to recover. Um, so it's really going to be up to sort of the eastern uh, eastern approach here on this side of the map to um, to really bring it home. No one's yet reached a victory city, and I don't know if that's because I'm playing too cautiously or, or what, but certainly you don't want to be throwing away units in this game because if they're destroyed, they don't come back and they give the opponent points. Speaking of points here, the Russians are actually doing a lot better job than the Austro-Hungarians right now. You can see the Russians have 21 points to the Austro-Hungarians 12. And like I mentioned at the beginning, you're getting uh, one point every time your infantry attacks. So uh, any attack uh, from infantry. So the Russians have had much more opportunities with obviously more units coming in uh, to sort of hit the Austro-Hungarians in places where they're weak, to thwart attacks, to, hit, to use delaying tactics and stuff like that. And so the Austro-Hungarians really need to take uh, some of these cities, otherwise they're going to be facing an end-of-game deficit that they're probably not going to be able to make up. Uh, but both sides being very careful not to lose units, because once that chink in the armor shows, uh, it's really tough to sort of claw it back. Figured I would do this combat on video, since it's um, pretty pivotal for the Russians, and also it has some relevance to the 1914 Serbian Musterbian playthrough. Um, so, the it's the Russian turn uh, here on September 6th, and the Russian 16th Corps here, which is these two divisions, um, with a combined total strength of 5 and 5 minus 1, 4, 9, um, are going to be attacking K Corps here, this stack of Austro-Hungarian units, and the 24th Corps, um, uh, 49th Division is also going to be assisting in the attack. In this game, um, the attack rules stay, state that uh, attacking can either be two independent units, so for example, this is an independent unit, has no core designation, or every unit of one core plus one other unit. So in this case, it's 16th core plus this 24th core division here, who has an attack strength of four. So we have got a total attack strength of 13, and they're going to be attacking K core. So uh, we are in turn uh, eight right now. So that means you get a victory point for attacking. So the Russians are going to get one there and they are comfortably ahead, doubling up the Austro-Hungarians right now. So I said, we've got 13. So let's look at the defense strength here. This K core unit is seven minus two. So that's five. Um, I'm all messing this up. The unit underneath there is four. So that's nine. And the unit under there is uh, two, so that's 11. So it's 13 to 11, looks like a one-to-one -one attack. We're gonna roll two dice and look at the combat chart on the one-to-one -one column. Oh, I, one thing I should mention, this is a what's considered a flank attack, and that is because um, every, uh, but all, the attacking units are throwing zones of control into five of the six hexes surrounding the target. So even though this unit here adjacent to K-Core uh, is next to them and blocking this hex, these units, there's a zone of control here, and this unit's throwing a zone of control here and here, so that's five of the six. So that's actually going to be two columns to the right, which is why I did this attack. Uh, so that takes us to the two to one column, and uh, we're going to, that's going to have some other negative effects as well after I roll this. What did we roll? We rolled a seven. Uh, that is going to be plus one and then minus one retreat one. So I will designate that for you. So the attackers are going to get plus one and the uh, defenders are going to have to retreat uh, one and they get minus one. And I'll explain what those modifiers mean, but they do have to back up. Now they have two choices. They've got to go toward, well, not, first of all, they have to go towards the supply source, which is down here off the map, but either hex here or here will work. Um, I believe if they retreat through a zone of control that is not canceled, that has some bad effects. So they are gonna probably have to go here. And that I believe is gonna cause an overstack situation. Yeah, because there's uh, two steps there and you can only have six steps in a hex. So we've got, uh, I believe, two, four, five, yeah, five here. So uh, they are going to have to go, uh, well, some of the units have, are going to have to retreat here. So uh, there's already, what is that, what did I say, two steps there? So we can have four more steps exist there. So this unit will go there, and this unit will go there. And then there is a rule that says if you cause an overstack via retreat, the remaining units uh, can retreat one more hex, and so we will send the uh, this brigade of k core here. Now, they got a retreat one minus one result. So what that means is now we roll dice again for each the attacker and the defender. Oh, and I should also say that I can take a ground here if I would like to. Um, I'm not going to right now because the uh, this stack here is actually putting the Germans um, in a tenuous supply uh, situation. So I am probably not going to take ground. This is I don't want to leave them out there kind of um, undefended. I could move here with them. Um... 
but uh, I don't know that I have to make that decision until after we see what happens here. Anyways, uh, so we got attacker plus one, defender retreat one minus one. So first we're gonna roll to see the combat uh, effectiveness uh, reductions for the uh, the attacker. So we're at plus one on the, on the die roll. Um, we are getting uh, then some other modifiers. So we look at the artillery strength of the defender. So we had two in that unit. And if I could get this properly, we had two in that unit and then we had one in this unit. So that's a total of five artillery points. That uh, is a plus one modifier, plus the one that they rolled on the combat table. So they're at a plus two modifier. And this was a large combat. There were two, four, six, eight, 10, 11 steps in the combat. So if it's over seven, it's a large combat. And that's the intensity. So we're looking on that chart. We roll with a plus two, we roll a five, that is a seven. Um, so that is a uh, two uh, combat effectiveness reduction for the attacker. So uh, this unit here, this unit and these units here will have to split two step uh, two effectiveness reductions between them. So the most logical choice here probably is to have this unit take one of them because it's full fully healthy or it was fully healthy. And then we have to figure out what, what we do with the other one. Now, if we take a second one to this 16th core, uh, he's probably not in a good spot to take that. So let's give the, the, the minus two here to the 24th core, 49th division. Um, and he's at combat effectiveness minus two. That means his attack and defense are subtracted by two. Um, so it's better to have that over there, I think. So now we have to roll for the defender and we look at the, um, we look at what they got. So they got a retreat and a minus one. So the ret any retreat result gives a plus one to the defender and that's canceled out by the minus one from the combat roll. It wasn't a very good combat roll from the Russians, but they were also surrounded, which means they get plus two. So they're at a plus two modifier to their die roll. And then we have to look at the artillery, um, uh, strength of the attacker. So we've got five here, 10, 15. So that's the maximum uh, call, uh, table for artillery. So that's going to be plus four. So in addition to the plus two um, from being surrounded or being flanked, they have a plus six. So we roll a D6 for them. They, yikes, uh, they rolled a five. So uh, that's going to mean that they get 11 and that's going to be four combat effectiveness reductions. That's a lot. Maybe the highest the Russians have achieved this game. So that means uh, they've got to take one here, and they have to split these evenly, unless it would eliminate a unit. So this one actually uh, flips this unit into a step loss. So that's one. Uh, this guy has to probably take one. So that goes there. This guy probably has to take one. Yeah. Um, so he's got to take one, and then we need to assign one. Oh, he's actually only a one-step unit. Um, so he would actually be eliminated. So we could put the other one... Uh, on this guy who's taken now two and we do need to take one more and we will probably ooh, this is tough we'll probably take it on um this guy here so k core in a really bad way and the reason i wanted to show you this combat with k core is because if you remember from our 1914 serbian musturbian playthrough k core actually shows up in that game about a week from now in game time uh, on the serbian front and so um the russians sending k core on their way the austro-hungarian uh, high command will now pull them back towards or at least elements of k core uh, to the serbian front and um so a nice little uh, tie and connection with that game and this game we have finally, just now, on turn the end of turn 10, so really two turns left in the game, over 75% of the way through it, have finally had one side uh, achieve a victory point objective on the map, uh, which is a little uh, disconcerting to me, given the way that this campaign played out historically. Uh, but the Austro-Hungarian 10th Corps finally managed to capture uh, Krasnostov, um, up here this turn by pushing some Russians off. The Russians got a little sloppy in their defense, maybe spread out a little too far, and the Austro-Hungarians spotted that. And so they decided to shift the focus from Lublin and sort of swing the entire uh, line, all these divisions, kind of to the to the east, to the northeast, and make a run on Krasn uh, Kras Krasnostov, I believe is how you pronounce that, uh, Chelm, and put uh, Hrubasov uh, under attack uh, to kind of where the where the Russians were sort of soft. And they managed to do that pretty well. They drove a force, the 10th Corps, really, which is their, I think, largest corps, or at least the most numer numerically superior corps, um, up through the middle here of the Russians and kind of forced them to one side or the other. Managed to grab the town, pushed off the defender, uh, did a step loss there. And uh, so that scored them three much-needed points, plus another one at the end of the turn for holding it. Uh, so... 
Um, while that was good, they are still well behind the Russians. The Russians with, right now, 41 points, the Austro-Hungarians with 26. So in the final two turns, they're going to have a lot of ground to make up, 15 points that they're going to have to somehow score. Um, and this game, it's really hard to eliminate units, um, like Mike Resch's other designs. Uh, it's, you know, much more about um, causing enough sort of cohesion damage to the units that they have to pull back off the line and recover. And in this game, you're really incentivized to not uh, let your units be destroyed, uh, obviously from the victory point standpoint, but because you cannot bring them back. You can see the Germans over here anchoring this, um, they're this stack right here. They're anchoring the, sort of that left flank of the Austro-Hungarians. They walked into kind of a snafu and they got really badly out of position and they haven't been able to do much German W core. They've, they've been taking a pounding. Um, they're close to breaking and being destroyed, but they managed to get out of there. So. That's what's going on up in the north. Here you can see some of the dead pile for each side talking about units being destroyed. Each side only managing to kill four units apiece. Um, so obviously that's gonna do nothing for the victory point differential, but the Russians really far ahead. Uh, and then down here around Lemberg, uh, the Russians, I mean, historically they blew past these Austro-Hungarians and forced the, these Austro-Hungarians off into the Carpathians, which is like off the map way down over here. Um, but uh, the Austro-Hungarians hanging in there and uh, still holding Lemberg right here. The Russians have sort of managed to get, um, our, sort of surround the city's sort of neighboring areas and kind of push the Austro-Hungarians into a very tight sort of salient here but just really unable to crack it. There's a lot of uh, really powerful defensive Austro-Hungarian stacks in there, and they're just gonna hold that uh, city. They have to hold that city, um, unless you know they don't want the Russians to get 10 points. That would basically put the game out of reach for them. So uh, not sure what the Russians are gonna be able to do to crack that. I, there's a lot of sort of brittle units in here, but the Russians aren't sure where, and obviously even playing solo, I'm not quite sure where, because you're not allowed to look at other stacks. So. Uh, that's kind of where we stand. We've got really two areas of operations going on. The Russians still trying to break through to get to Lemberg. That 10 points would win it for them. Austro-Hungarians now feeling emboldened, maybe to go after Chelm or uh, over here at Hrubasov. Um, the Russians really need to sort of readjust and reform in a more defensively tenable position because right now they're a little spread out. Well, here we are at the end of it. The Game is over. I've chosen not to play the final Austro-Hungarian turn because there's no actual way they can get any more points. Um, certainly not enough to win, even if they did eliminate a Russian unit or two, but that seems very unlikely. It's hard to eliminate units in this game. And this is where we stand. The Russians on the doorstep of Lemberg here have it surrounded on four sides, but this stack still pretty potent defensively, and I, I mean, everything is so worn down and exhausted. I would say that the Austro-Hungarians uh, would consider this a victory, um, considering the way it went historically is the Russians, like I said, blew past here, surrounded this fortress. All the, the Austro-Hungarian army went this way off the map. Uh, and the Austro-Hungarians up here made further progress than they did historically as well, I believe, capturing this town here. Um, they held that for the last two turns, so that helped them out quite a bit. That was five points they wouldn't have had otherwise. Um, never really got close to Lublin, um, Russians managed to lock that down pretty hard, but the sort of strategic reorientation of this army uh, ended up bearing fruit for them. So uh, again, likely that they don't have the strength at this point to even push through to any of these other victory point areas. Um, even holding this uh, for another turn would have been difficult. <clears throat> so this is where we end. This is where we wind up. Uh, the Russians comfortably win. Um, they have a final score of 48 points. The Austro-Hungarians, 32 points. Um, and therein lies kind of something that doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. Um, so all of the Russians' points came from attacking on turns one through nine uh, with their infantry and their massive uh, force that they had pile up over the first couple of turns. And they managed to score all those points without taking a single geographic victory objective. Not a single Austro-Hungarian victory objective was, um, was accomplished by them, and they won the game basically halfway through. It was pretty clear that the Russians were going to win. Um, so I think that's a major flaw with the game. Uh, and, and I have some theories behind that having now played it through 12 turns, but uh, I'm going to start here with what I like about the game. First of all, I really like the look of the game, despite the Russians being brown. I do like the map and, and whatnot. The counters are really nice and thick. Uh, the rule set is pretty simple to play with, um, and you know, you can get going real fast. Um, and it makes for an interesting conflict. You know, there's some different approaches you could take. Maybe I could have played it better and tried to work the supply angle. It's just tough because when you're outside a certain distance from your supply sources, your units become less effective. So you have to really take approaches that can that can help you. But, um, and, and I think that the combat system, um, so this game is less deterministic than um, like Serbian Misturbian, for example, be, simply for the fact that units don't have 
an action rating or a proficiency rating. So you're not going into combat um, knowing you're going to be up a column or down a column. It's a little more dynamic than that, uh, which is nice because it takes away some of the futility of trying to mount offensive attacks. Now, um, in this game, defense is way more powerful than offense, which you know you would expect that out of World War One, and really any sort of infantry-based combat, you would expect that. Um, but the feel of the combat between units does feel really um, historically appropriate. You know, you're not getting a lot of losses, but you're grinding down the unit's um, efficiency or, or sort of effectiveness as you go, and you're having to rotate units out and rotate units in, and it's kind of a puzzle to figure out how you can bring the most force to bear uh, against the targets you're going after. So on a on a combat to combat uh, basis, um, it, it feels a lot better than his other games. Um, more interesting. I do like that there's a shell game being played where you're you're not allowed to look at stacks, so you don't quite know how ineffective units are. You you only see the top most most powerful unit. You don't know what's under him. You don't know how those units are um, holding up. And so you're constantly trying to move around your troops to make sure your opponent can't really figure out where you're weak. And you're trying as the offensive player, the attacking player, to hit areas where your opponent is weak, um, which is kind of a cool dynamic and I think would play well face to face. Um, so I would say that, um, uh, you know, I had more fun with this than I did with Serbian Musturbian. Now, it did, in the second half of the game, start to reveal a lot of flaws to me, and a lot of those flaws are tied to two things, in my opinion. One, again, units, there's no difference between divisions. Divisions all literally have the same strength, with very few exceptions. I mean, divisions are usually 574 units, brigades are usually 444 or 344, and that is true across both armies. And, um... I mean, why couldn't we get some unit variation here? You know, how come we couldn't have... I mean, there's a little bit. Like, this is a 584, which is, I guess, slightly better. Um, but there's just very few differentials between the units, and so it just kind of feels like you're playing with generic, um, you know, generic forces. Like, where... Uh, give me some interplay between the attack and defenders. Let me, like, target some weaker units, you know? Um, or at least give me the opportunity to have more powerful units go after units that are kind of standardized. So um, that, it just feels a little generic across the line. It feels like you're just kind of playing with carbon copies, like every division is the same, every brigade is the same. And that actually wouldn't be the case, right? Certain divisions might have more or less competent leadership. They might have more or less competent equipment or personnel. So I would have liked to see even just small variations in the units, and that I think would have made the game a lot more dynamic. And um, the other thing I, I don't like, and I'm, I am convinced, so I said the combat, from a combat to combat perspective, feels pretty World War One and feels pretty good. That is true, but I think over the long term and sort of the larger picture of the game, the strategic picture of the game, I actually think it's impossible for the Russians to make as much progress as they did historically. I mean, they're nowhere near this fortress when historically they went past it and surrounded it and kept marching. And there's no way to get these Austro-Hungarian units pushed back that far. And part of the reason is that this combat table um, doesn't have enough retreat results at lower odds. The game, I would say 90% of the game was played on these four columns right here, right? You very rarely got 2.5 to 1, 3 to 1, 4 to 1, or less than that. And when you're working in this when in this band, you have to roll extremely well on 2d6 to get even one retreat, let alone two or three retreats. So this combat table is extremely static and does not do a good job of uh, making pushing the armies back to where they should go. Um, and that is compounded um, by the fact that the rules about who can attack and defend make it impossible to use all of your strength in any given attack. Now, I understand why he did it, and he does this in other games. To attack, all the units of a single core can attack, plus one other unit. And defending, all units of a single core uh, can, can defend, plus one other unit if they are able to stack with another unit. Okay, in theory that makes sense, but in gameplay, per, for gameplay uh, purposes, it means you can never, in a situation like this surrounding Lemberg, I could never have any sort of coordinated attack between these four forces. So while this looks bad for the Austrians, it isn't really, in fact, this stack versus two stacks, wherever the uh, Russians would choose to attack from. And that artificially prevents your forces from being able to bring lots of strength to bear against any particular target, and therefore puts a cap on the amount of attack strength and the amount of defense strength that you're able to have in any one combat. And because they're is a cap and because defense is always better um, attacking in a lot of situations is never going to result in any sort of pushing of the armies away it will result in the degrading of the units but you'll never be able to get any sort of advance i mean the russians i spent most of the game basically playing between these two hex, these six hex rows and over here playing between these six hex rows there was there was literally never a um never an opportunity to get further than that and while that may be sort of realistic to World War One, where you're trying to take yards, in early 1914, especially on the Eastern Front, it, there was much more maneuver involved here, and I didn't feel like this game brought that out, which is unfortunate. 
um, because I really do like the core mechanics here more than his other, well, at least Serbian Misturbian. And the fact that you still have this problem of um, the geography not even being able to be utilized. I mean, this map doesn't need to be this big. I, I think it's literally impossible with the combat system to get units down here from the Russians or to get even down here through the Russians. I mean, there's no reason to have this section of the map or that section of the map. I mean, you could play this basically on eight total hex rows, essentially. So ultimately, it's very unfulfilling and disappointing. And so I think he, there needs to be some some work done here to... I like the core combat system. I just think that the, the combat results table needs to have more retreats on it so that you can push units out of positions and so you're not just turn after turn after turn. I mean, I had the Russians down here for basically five turns trying to attack Lemberg, and it's only now after five turns that they've managed to push out that first line of defenders back beyond the city. It's gonna probably take another two or three turns, if not more, to uh, get the actual city itself. And the fact that the Russians can win without taking in a single victory objective just makes absolutely no sense. Um, that shouldn't be possible. Uh, so, uh, not sure why the balance during playtesting wasn't caught there, but it doesn't seem, you know, you're incentivized because, like I said, because of the way that attacking and defending is limited, you're incentivized as a defender to stack up as many units as you can from a single core in a single hex. And because movement rates are so low, four, and because zones of control are, take away, you know, are so slow, which is one of the things I like, actually, the fact that cavalry can be used not as combat units for the most part, but they're used as sort of a screening force to slow down approaching units, right? You get into a zone of control it takes you an extra movement point cavalry can back off before they're able to be attacked and then maybe you've used all your movement points to get there but it really slows down marching which is you know how a cavalry force would work in this in this particular era you harass you slow down you make sure that you're screening for uh, your units to be able to recover and so forth so i actually think that's a great positive of the game and it's not really apparent in the rules but once you start playing you realize that's how you're supposed to use your cavalry the problem is is that movement rates are so low at this scale for these units that it's impossible to make any sort of advances in any quick amount of time and so it really slows down. And so once you get into combat and you're locked in like this, it's just turn after turn after turn. And the fact that you can break away, send a new stack in, that stack recovers, and the defender can do the same thing, you end up just kind of rolling dice against each other back and forth. And um, no one gets any movement. So ultimately, while I do enjoy this game better than Serbian Misturbian, um, I, do, I am disappointed with it. I thought it would be uh, a little more interesting because it started out interesting, but um, it, it finished very dull. Um, I would say that if you're interested in Mike Rush's other games, so Serbian Misturbian or Offensive Outrance, but you don't want to make the investment in you know a huge, long, big game like that, try this one. And if you like it, you will like the other games. And if you don't like this, you will not like the other games. This is a really good sort of taster for his design style and his systems. Um, and I think this game would be, there probably is more enjoyment face-to-face, -face, I, I would say. Um, but overall, playing it, it became a really dull affair uh, when it was clear that Russians were going to win and win without having to take their objectives. So uh, I think probably, uh, you know, I, I think that this game could stand to be revisited for balance uh, purposes after having played it one time, um, unless there's something I'm missing, because there's no reason to have a long stretched out front. You are entirely at a disadvantage if you are defending with a single unit to keep uh, like a long uh, single line of units out. Uh, you are incentivized by the system to stack up, stack up, stack up as both the attacker and the defender, and so the game ends up going nowhere. Anywho, that is uh, my uh, look at the Battle for Galicia 1914 from Compass Games in Paper Wars issue 97. Yep, 97 from last year. Um, I, you know, I might play it again face to face, but if I had the choice between this or When Eagles Fight from Ted Racer and GMT, I'm choosing When Eagles Fight because that game feels a lot more. Uh, exciting, dramatic, and things actually happen, and you can get strong pushes in that game, um, at least early on. So I uh, hope you enjoyed this. We're going to be doing another World War I game next, and that's going to be uh, Swassel 18, or excuse me, Swassel 1918 from um, Legion War Games. Very excited about that one. It looks a little bit crunchier. Uh, so I hope you join me for that, and, uh, you know, plenty more content coming to the channel soon. See ya.